thank you for the slight health warning, and thank you, those of you who took him up on it. Uh, okay. We'll be bringing it on. Okay. Let's begin with what I suspect is the most recent thing that most of us have encountered of yours with the Kissinger film. Okay. I guess we better hold these up to our mouths. Is this okay? All right. Let's begin with what I suspect is the most recent thing of yours that most of us have encountered, which is the Kissinger film and the book that gave rise to it. Uh, what you were really doing in the film and the book is telling us that Henry Kissinger ought to be indicted as a war criminal. Give us a bill of particulars of the indictment. Well, war criminal is Henry Kissinger's job description and has been since he first caught Richard Nixon's eye as a talented guy in 1968. And since then he's had a sort of one-man international rolling uh, crime wave extending not just through the subversion of the United States election of that year and the betrayal and subversion of the Paris peace talks, both of them, in my opinion, uh, acts of treason, but through the devastation of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, the prolonging of an unjust war of aggression and atrocity for at least four years. In those four years, you will remember, comrades, um, about half the names on the Vietnam Memorial were inscribed, and we wouldn't have the nerve or the ability to, to put up a wall that would have all the names of the Indo-Chinese on it. Uh, then to Chile, to the destruction of parliamentary democracy and the murder of its president. Um, then to Cyprus, uh, a similar coup against an elected uh, president, uh, the destruction of a democracy, the partition of Cyprus between two aggressive uh, NATO powers. Uh, then the uh, direct uh, individual collusion, sitting in the room, with the planners of the invasion and extirpation of East Timor. And I don't think I have exhausted, no, I've left out Angola, for example, I've left out Bangladesh. I've done this a lot of times, I always leave out something. I, I've, I sometimes look at my own stuff and think, is this all true? I went over it with the fact checkers and felt sick at thinking, really, we're not, you know, all of this is, abs it, it all did happen, it all really did occur. Um, now, since, uh, the book came out and since the film um, was made, um, I can report some at least mildly encouraging developments. Um, on Memorial Day last year, um, I'm proud to say just after my book came out in French, Mr. Kissinger was visited in the Ritz Hotel in Paris by the gendarmerie and served with a summons to testify about what he knew about the disappearance of French people in Chile. He fled town. He, he fled town on the same day and hasn't gone back, and, and the summons is still current if he does go. Uh, since then, the magistrates in Argentina, Judge Rodolfo Corral, who's the main prosecutor in the death squad cases in Argentina, have summoned him as well. So has Judge Guzman uh, from Chile, the, the justice in the Pinochet case. I went down to Chile a few months ago and testified before Judge Guz Guzman myself against uh, Kissinger. Case is being built. The Brazilian government recently told Kissinger to cancel a trip, an official trip he was making. Um, he, an attempt was made to arrest him on his last visit to London. It's not much, but the air around the bastard is being shrunk a bit. The oxygen's being taken away. And he, um, and he can't travel much, and when he does, he has to consult lawyers. And there is in federal court in Washington, D.C., filed, alas, on September the 11th, 2001, which, as you also know, is the anniversary of the coup in Chile, but for that reason not as well known as it might be, um, the relatives of General Schneider, the murdered head of the Chilean general staff in 1970, have filed a federal suit against Henry Kissinger for murder. And every document in that uh, suit is a U.S. government declassified document. That's, as far as I know, an unprecedented lawsuit. And this is good news, too. Um, so at least I think I can say I've probably changed his obituary. Um, I used to wish he would die. Now I hope he will live until justice catches up with him. But let me just remark something to you. Chilean courts, Argentine courts, French courts, Chilean civilians bringing their own lawsuit, paying for it themselves, who've already had family members murdered. What's missing here? What's missing here is a sense of shame on the part of everyone in the United States. Why is an American district attorney not doing this? Why is Congress not doing it? 
why the American court's not doing it, and why is the United States government sheltering a wanted war criminal? These are the main questions. Didn't he come after you, um, he, what, he called you a Holocaust denier, and then you forced him to retract it, right? Well, I, sh I, I tried to get him to sue me, um, because I, in, in England, where the, the libel law favors the plaintiff very much, and in other jurisdictions, I called him a murderer, a liar, um, a kidnapper, an accomplice to torture and kidnap, um, uh, and a bogus scholar who had, who had falsified three volumes of memoirs um, based on documents that he had stolen. And several of the reviewers in England said, well, if he doesn't sue on any of this, he's not much of a gentleman. <laughs> Which I already knew, actually, to tell you the truth. So then, he, for a long time, he wouldn't comment when he was asked. And in fact, at, at several occasions, including at the National Press Club in Washington, he made it a condition of his appearance that he not be asked any questions about me. And sometimes people, I'm afraid to say, agreed to those conditions. But finally, he lost patience, because he did get asked. And he said, well, why should he, why should he answer to someone who'd abused Mother Teresa and denied the Holocaust. And I thought, what does he care about Mother Teresa? And what's he doing bringing this up? Uh, so I wrote to him, or through a lawyer I wrote to him, I've never done this before, and said, I'll see you in court if you uh, don't take that back. And shouldn't you be suing me? Um, <laughs> and his lawyers replied the following day and said, he, our client undertakes not to repeat the allegation. And I wrote back saying, that's not good enough. You have to withdraw it. He obviously thought it was worth trying. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful smear. And he did retract it, and you can look it up on my website if you like, the correspondence between us. But that's, I mean, that was a victory of a kind. I wanted to see him in court because I could then have brought witnesses from Chile, from East Timor, um, from, from Cyprus, from Cambodia, and so on. We, had, we, were, we were getting it ready. Who could say, well, yes, and furthermore, we can show that the, uh, pl the plaintiff is, um, excuse me, the defendant is a habitual liar and has lied on a number of things and makes a practice of lying and has made a career out of it, we were looking forward to it. So it was the apology I didn't want. But I repeat, the disgrace is that there is no proceeding against, the United, against him by any organ of law or justice in the United States. The United States shelters him as a wanted war criminal and that the United States opposes the establishment of an international criminal court because it knows that it is sheltering a wanted war criminal. And he would certainly be defendant number one, I presume, in that court. Um, in looking back over your work over the years, one of the things that I've always admired is the way that you have been very consistent in writing about human rights issues and human rights abuses wherever they occur. Uh, Eastern Europe and the Soviet era, Chile, South Africa, the Kurds, before anybody else was writing about them. You've always been a staunch backer of uh, rights for the Palestinians, many other places as well. And unlike a lot of us, you actually seem to, to go to all these places. Uh, and I'm thinking if the FBI and CIA have 150 pages on me, the intelligence services of many countries must have thousands of pages on you. And I'm wondering whether in your travels there have been any key experiences, key encounters that started you on this path, or were the key experiences, were they things that came before you started going to the various hotspots? Well, you make me sound more intrepid than I am, um, Adam, but I would say if you asked what was a formative or turning point experience for me, it would probably be, um, there would have been two in the last decade. One was my last visit to Kurdistan, to um, the Kurdish provinces of northern Iraq, uh, at the end of the Gulf War, where I, I visited um, Halabja, the town that was uh, destroyed with um, chemical weapons, and where the, the, the wounds that are inflicted by weapons like that stick around for a long time. They, they, they keep burning on people's skin and flesh, and you can, you can see this stuff still sizzling on people. You can see them still suffering from it. And I, I have a, f a photograph of myself uh, sitting on the unexploded chemical bomb that the Iraqis left behind. They, they tried to destroy the evidence, but they left one behind, and there it is with their Air Force markings and so on. I mention it because sometimes there are people on the right, and some fools on the left, too, who still try and deny that it was the Iraqis that did that. The point I'm making about wh why it had a big effect on me, though, is slightly different. It's this. I realized that here was an unintended consequence of the Gulf War. 
that by accident and as a result of massive uh, international public opinion, because the Kurds ended that war, as you remember, scattered over the hillsides, um, starving and dispersed and dispossessed, uh, there, was, there was a forcible international intervention to put an umbrella, a cover, over them, which still exists. And so my question to those who talk too glibly about American imperialism is, would they now demand that American jets stop flying over Kurdistan and stop protecting the Kurds, or not? And if they would, and if they would, I'd, I'd of course be very glad to hear their reasons, and if they wouldn't, would they examine those implications? Because I think they're quite, they're quite important ones. Remember, you know, there are, we think, probably not less than 30 million Kurds, maybe more, in, in Turkey, Iraq, uh, Syria, and Iran mainly, that they're the largest people in the world without a state, and that they're the oldest cause of the left in the Middle East. I mention these things because um, it sometimes seems to me they don't get mentioned enough. Do you see in your ideal future a state for all Kurds in all the countries in which they, they are, or autonomy within the countries in which they are? How, I mean, just get utopian for a moment. What would you well, like Well, no, to I see think there? it's quite important not to demand, if you, if you take a position of solidarity with some national movement, as for example, I mean, Edward Said and I produced a book of essays on the Palestine question back in 1982 before the last intifada. And I've spoken countless times about this and written a lot about it, but I, I, I never want to take a position that is more militant, if you like, than the, than the friends I have in this other movement. It seems to me for them to decide if they can compromise or not, not for me. Um, and so when the, when, the, when the Iraqi Kurdish leadership says, as it now does, it's content to be Iraqi, to say we are, we are Iraqis, but we, are, but we insist on being regarded as Kurds and granted autonomy, uh, I don't think that's a betrayal, no. Um, and since the uh, Kurds in the neighboring countries also uh, don't demand that they all be fused into one state, um, I don't feel that I'm being uh, unduly moderate either. I think, and I think that's probably a fairly good rule of thumb. But I think they would be as justified in demanding a state as any other national minority with a common language and culture would be. And it's very much to their credit that they're willing for the sake of a peaceful agreement to, and to give up uh, quite a lot of their dignity and quite a lot of their history to regimes that, you know, in the past, good, good and sufficient reasons in the past, they have no right, no, sorry, no reason to trust. I think you were going to say, in the answer to my question before this, that there was another formative experience for you. Um, well, there was. I just want to say one more thing about the Kurds before we're done. Hmm. Um, these guys are for regime change, okay? My Kurdish comrades are. They've been for it for a very long time. They've been fighting for it for a very long time. They've lost swaths of population fighting for it. They're not going to be cheated of it. They think this time they can get rid of Saddam Hussein. They have many brave Iraqi friends willing to join them on this. My solidarity is with them in case anyone wanted to ask me about it. Okay. I am for, and have always been for, those Kurds and Iraqis fighting for the overthrow and destruction of the Saddam Hussein regime. I was for regime change before any Bush family member was for it. And if necessary, I'll be for it long after they give it up. But I'm for it, okay? And I'm... Well. The other one was Bosnia. I had to go... I felt I had to go to Sarajevo during the siege of Sarajevo in 1992. And I hope no one will think I'm being Eurocentric if I say that having seen terrible things before in, in Kurdistan, among other places, and Southern Africa, and so forth, that I was kind of shocked to see a, a city in, in Europe uh, being reduced to rubble and beggary um, and destruction and its population put to the sword um, in the 90s. I hadn't, I hadn't, think, I hadn't thought, rather, I didn't think I would have to endure that, let alone that they would have to, and the inhabitants of Mostar and many other cities too. And uh, bad as that was to see the Serbian Orthodox Christian uh, racists uh, trying to destroy Muslim Bosnia, but also the Catholic uh, Christian Croatian fascists colluding with them in this operation, and with NATO colluding in the partition of Bosnia and dis dismemberment and destruction of Bosnia between these two forces. And it seemed to me quite uh, essential that, the, that Europe, having watched the destruction of the Armenians uh, by Turkey, in the early part of the century, and then seen the 
attempt to destroy the whole of European Jewry made by German imperialism in the middle of the century could not end the century by saying, well, let's have a Muslim minority destroyed too before we get the 20th century over with. To watch that would be impossible. And the fact remains that it was only by a, a tremendous struggle within the United States to change opinion in Congress and in, the, and in the government that the necessary force was mobilized to prevent that from happening. And if that had not been done, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo would now be a howling wilderness, a post-genocidal howling wilderness. And again, in case anyone wanted to ask me about this, I'll state for the record, I don't regard that rescue operation as having been American imperialism. One... <clears throat> One theme I see running through what you've written is uh, an extreme dislike of organized religion. And uh, <laughs> I've heard you quoted as saying that uh, if you died and went to heaven, you would be aghast to find that there was one. Uh, <clears throat> and recently, uh, I think you said or wrote that for you, the real axis of evil is uh, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. <laughs> well. As they say on exam essay questions, expand and explain. Um, being religious is like living in North Korea. Um, you have endless opportunities to praise the leader, to thank him for giving you everything, to thank him for looking after you, to thank him for all his boundless gifts, to thank him for all the, his tireless efforts on your behalf. Um, a celestial North Korea is what the religious believer wants. But there's, there is there's one, I suppose there are two differences. Um, you can defect from North Korea. <laughs> and you can die and just cease to exist in North Korea. But if you're a religious believer, the leader goes on persecuting you after you're dead. You have to go on praising him forever and thanking him for being born and for all this. This is servility squared. It's the, it, is, it is the slave mentality, it's contemptible and cowardly. And, it's, it, and it's, it's the enemy of the intellect, it's the enemy of free inquiry, it's the enemy of reason. Um, and what I would add is that those who practice it or preach it additionally piss me off by pretending that they're humble about this. They say, Well, don't mind me. I'm just on an errand for God at the moment. Um, I'm extremely modest about this. I'm very humble and abject. It's, um, but it's just that God wants me to be doing this. Um, and the reason why I'm ecumenical about it, I suppose, is because all of them partake of the same illusion. All monotheisms particularly partake of, of the same uh, absurdities. And the Quran, uh, um, I regard as especially horrible because it validates both the claims of Christianity and of Judaism. I mean, the, the, the Quran insists that Jesus was a real prophet and so was Mo, so were Moses and Abraham. So there you have the whole horrible thing in, in plain view. And the name of the religion, Islam, is simply the word for surrender, as it should be. And the posture of it is one of surrender and abjection, as it should be. And this is poison, frankly. And um, I, have, I have nothing but contempt for it. And in case you wonder if I can tell the sinner from the sin, I can, but I have a slight contempt for the people who believe it, too. Okay. But if they keep it in the home where it belongs, I don't mind. Okay. Uh, you've written that for you the September 11th attacks were a big turning point. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I've, I've, wrote, I've written that I think it's, the cliché is true that September 11th is a big turning point, that it did alter a number of things, and I don't dissent for once. I mean, I like to always think, well, what's wrong with the, the prevailing cliché or the prevailing wisdom? But in this case, I thought, well, that, that's true. That's, that's a, what the Germans call a tendons vendor. It's a turning point. Uh, for me, I, I, it wasn't that much of one on the essential question. I thought that the 14th of... Um, February 1989 was the turning point. And that was the day when uh, my friend Salman Rushdie received a, a directly uh, incited threat of murder, uh, accompanied with an offer of bounty. In other words, murder solicited for pay 
in public in his own name from the theocratic leader of a foreign state, of which he, he Salman, was not a citizen, for writing a novel. And if you like, I'll say all that again. Some people forget what the fat law was. I, the Ayatollah Khomeini, will offer money for your murder for writing a novel. And I'll also offer a ticket to paradise to anyone willing to attack you or those who helped you with the book. Um, and I thought, well, there you have it. A, a perfectly arranged collision between all the things I hate and um, all the things I quite like. Uh, the things I quite like, by the way, are free expression, the right to write novels without death threats, and so on. Um, and I remember President Bush the next day was asked, um, did he have a comment on this? And he said, no, why should he? Uh, this is President Bush Sr. As far as he, were, he was concerned, no American interests were involved. And I remember Susan Sontag pointing out, well, it would be paltry to say Mr. Rushdie's then wife was an American who'd had to go into hiding with him. Um, might it perhaps be said that American interests were involved in, say, the protection of novelists from state-supported terrorism. Anyway, you don't get that now. You wouldn't get that kind of sappy, stupid comment now, because the long period of underreaction to um, theocratic fascism is now over. But until September the 11th, what I thought was that there was a great deal of underreaction to it, and a, a, an unwillingness to confront it, an unwillingness to confront the threat that it represents, an unwillingness to realize how ruthless it was, how much it means business for us. Uh, how certain its defeat is, by the way, but how absolutely we must uh, hurry that defeat along. What about the other? Um, what about the other two religions in your axis of evil there, uh, and the well, the theocratic fascist tendencies yes. that they occasionally? Practice? Not alone uh, did the President Bush show indifference that day, but um, the same day. Um, Cardinal O'Connor of New York, a great prince of the church, announced that the problem was not the offer of money for murder by a religious leader, but the problem was profanity on the part of the author. He was joined in this by the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, by the Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, and by the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. In other words, there was a wonderful reverse ecumenical um, uh, lineup of, of characters, all of whom said the problem is not the offer of murder um, for, for the destruction of literature, the problem is profanity. And I thought, well, I'm very glad that you guys have all sort of, as it were, clustered together, because there'd be more of a chance of getting you all with one grenade. Okay. Okay. I want to move on to the and then you could make them into fertilizer, and then that'd be the first honest day's work they'd done in their lives if you spread them on the fields. <laughs> I want to move on to the subject that I think is on, on everybody's minds these last few months in the U.S., which is the possible war with Iraq. You have at times voiced general support for the prospect of going to war with Iraq. Are you still feeling that way? Under what circumstances? What would change it? Spell out your position for us. Well, in the first place, I'm not for a war with Iraq, and I don't think there will be one. I've no quarrel with the Iraqi people or with the Iraqi nation, and I don't believe anyone else uh, here does. However, there is going to be a confrontation with the Saddam Hussein regime, and it's being forced upon us. And the consequences, um, in my opinion, will occur uh, whether or not there is a fight because the Saddam Hussein regime is already imploding because of its own horrific internal character. And the, the dam of hatred and chaos and havoc that has built up behind the Ba'ath Party dictatorship, accumulated behind it over the last many years, will burst and spread in any case. So you have two alternatives. Watch that happen and wonder what will occur, or intervene and see if you can try to condition it. Now, it seems to me that the second choice is the obvious one, and that um, those who've worked so patiently and bravely to bring this about should be the people we're working with. Um, I mean by that, the, the, uh, particularly the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan, the PUK, but the, the Kurdish rebels in general, and the Iraqi National Congress. This should be a, not just a priority for the United States government, but it should be a priority of those citizens in the, of the United States who consider themselves committed to human rights. If they imagine that just by watching it or staying neutral, 
they can, as it were, avoid or escape the consequences. They are quite clearly wrong. The, the Saddam Hussein regime has staked everything on the acquisition of the weapons of genocide. And if it was to acquire them, we know what it wants them for. It is also the sponsor of a great deal of international gangsterism. We're not completely certain of the extent of its connection with Mr. Bin Laden. We know Mr. Bin Laden supports Saddam Hussein. Uh, it's interesting. We don't know if Mr. Saddam Hussein necessarily supports Mr. Bin Laden, but we know that the suicide bombers are supported and encouraged and paid for from Iraq. We know the Abu Nidal organization, which committed many murders among the Palestinian leadership, uh, was supported and endorsed from, from Iraq. And we also know that there is a case, a quite clear case to be made against Saddam Hussein for war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And the United States government, were it not for its protection of Kissinger, would, would and should be bringing that case before the United Nations and the International Court of Justice. But those who care about these things should be pressing for more action and more careful action and more, and more action based upon the principles of human rights and not less, and not being neutral about it. But here, okay, both, both you and George Bush are talking about war with Iraq to eliminate Saddam Hussein. But beyond that, I sense that there are two different wars you're talking about. You're talking about, uh, you know, guaranteeing autonomy for the Kurds, pluralism, democracy, and so forth. But are those the purposes of Bush's war? And are the people that Bush is wanting to work with the same people that you would be wanting to work with to reconstruct uh, Iraq after the war. After all, uh, the general in uh, Denmark who got arrested a couple of days ago, General Nizar uh, Khazraji, who was one of the people I understand that the Bush people had tipped to lead an army in Iraq post Saddam Hussein, he's now been indicted for his role in the gassing of the Kurds in the 1980s. So are you and George Bush talking about two different wars here? Um, there, there is a faction of the administration that would be happy just to have a military coup. Just to have a... Just to have a military coup yeah. in, in, um, in Baghdad. Um, and has been working along those lines and, as you say, isn't very choosy about who it picks and would settle for a military government. After all, that's what the CIA always does best. We can usually find you a general willing to take over. They haven't actually succeeded in that in this case. It wouldn't be the worst thing. It would be better than the status quo, and it would at least lead to an invitation to the inspectors and others to come in and, and identify and destroy the sites where weapons of genocide are being incubated. But no, you're quite right. It wouldn't satisfy me or the long-suffering Iraqi or Kurdish people. And then there's another thing uh, which the administration won't say, but I know is split about. I mean, what this really is, is a war against Saudi Arabia. That's why the Saudis are so against the regime change in Iraq, and that's why they won't even let the base that the United States built for them be used for it. <coughs> because they know that with Saddam gone, their buffer state and client is gone, and they also know that with the recuperation of Iraqi oil, their oil monopoly and oligopoly in the region which the, with which they've helped to spread bin Ladenism around the globe is gone. And I can't wait for that bit to happen either. I accept the logical and probable consequences of this in other words. There's going to be some terrific domino effect here. Sometimes people, you hear people on the left saying, well, it might destabilize the region. And I say, well, I've heard worse words than instability, actually, when it comes to the Saudi monarchy, for example. And the, the, there's an extraordinary boldness on the part of a wing, at least, of the uh, Republican intellectuals in that they've decided to make war on what they used to think of as their status quo. And I don't think that the, uh, the sheer drama and interest of that and the possible excellent consequences are sufficiently discussed. Well, if you talk about destabilizing the region, don't the recent election results in Pakistan and Turkey make you think that if things get riled up, it could, in fact, strengthen the forces of, of Muslim fundamentalism? No, I don't, because um, for three reasons. One, well, there's, first, there's, there's a general reason which would apply to all of them. Um, even if these forces are elected, uh, they will find you can't run a society out of the Quran. 
um, it can't, or any other holy book. It can't be done. It's been tried many times. It's a repeated failure. Uh, the most encouraging sign of this is the way that the Iranian people are already emerging on the other side of theocracy. Uh, they've, they've thrown it off, especially the younger generation. They've repudiated it so far peacefully, and so far, I'm glad to say, without any outside help, it's the most single encouraging thing in the Middle East. That's why you never, never hear the peace movement types talk about the Iranian street. Uh, the Iranian street has about 70 million people. It's nearly as big as the Arab street, but people don't talk about it because the Iranian street is 100% pro-US policy, anti-Saddam Hussein, and anti-Mullah in the region. And we can hope for great things from that. Uh, by the same token, um, the, the Turkish electorate is simply having an election in which a party that has an Islamic inflection has won and is allowed a peaceful transition of power. That absolutely proves the secular character of Turkish society. It's a very encouraging development. Um, and so, no, we, we, we can have the confidence that we're right about this. Only a secular society can guarantee freedom of religion, and uh, only a secular society can offer any hope of progress. And the people will find that out either by learning it or, or finding it out from bitter experience. Uh, last August, you wrote the following. What the Iraqi and Kurdish Democrats would like is American aid for an endorsement of their own efforts to replace the regime. And what they fear is what I also fear, a heavy-handed US attack, which results in an Iraqi puppet government that is designed to placate the Saudis and the Turks. Now, have you changed your feeling on that point? Are you more optimistic that uh, this is not going to happen? Well, no, that's, that, Adam, that's the earlier question you asked, but in a different way, or rather, as I might have asked it, as I might have answered it, excuse me, uh, some time ago. I just think the situation has moved on from that now. It's very obvious that neither the Turkish, I'm sorry, it's very obvious that neither the Saudi authorities nor the Turkish military ones um, want such a thing to happen and that if it does, it will be therefore by definition overruling them. Um, but it's also become much plainer uh, that there's no status quo that can be protected by a non-intervention policy. In other words, if you don't intervene if no one intervenes. The Saddam Hussein regime will collapse and bring great chaos and havoc in its wake in any case. It was very striking, I thought, to see the other day what happened when after, oh, the prisons. When after humiliatingly yeah. forcing the Iraqi people not just to vote for him 100%, but to turn out for him 100%. I mean, to, to abnegate them and humiliate them one last time and force them to treat him like a god. Uh, put them through, through that disgusting experience that he said, well, let's open the jails, at least the jails that contain the rapists and pickpockets and pimps and murderers. In other words, I suppose the people he thought were his natural constituency. <laughs> and find that within hours, the guards and the warders at the prison were helping to break down the bars and the walls and let, down, let out everybody, or at least everybody they could find. Because most of the families who came to the prison gates found that their loved one isn't on the list of detainees, has been probably sawn in half on a table and a video made of it for his family some time ago. Um, and there were spontaneous demonstrations in the streets not long after that. And the police quite clearly had no instructions about how to deal with them. That's the, sh that's the Nikolai Ceausescu moment. That's the moment when the man's made his last mad speech from the balcony. He's beginning to go nuts, to beginning to consider concessions. It means it's over morally and it's about to be over politically. The only question is, are you going to help with the intervention or are you going to be neutral about it? And I've, even though I tried to hedge in what you quoted me as saying a few months ago, uh, I was at least clear on what side I was on. What about the factor of oil? I mean, would Bush be so eager to launch this war if what Iraq had the world's uh, first or second largest proven reserves of was, say, potatoes rather than oil? Um, the Cheney Energy Plan, the one that the Enron folks helped him write, uh, has the U.S. rising, you know, of course, spurns all talk of alternative energy and has the U.S. rising to importing two-thirds of its oil by the year 2020. 
and uh, Ahmed Shalabi, whom Rumsfeld and Cheney seem to want to install as the leader of Iraq, told the Washington Post recently, American companies will have a big shot at Iraqi oil. And the Heritage Foundation has already put out a detailed plan for privatizing Iraq's oil industry, uh, mostly into American hands. Uh, does that concern you? Um, my view has always been you should never be deterred from doing the right thing by the thought that it might also be in your interests. The, sorry, did you hear that? No. I'll say it again. You should never be deterred from doing the right thing by the thought that it might also be in your own interests. There's only one country that can hope to uh, rebuild the uh, Iraqi oil industry. Let's be realistic. Um, the, Iraqi oil, the, the Iraqi oil industry is now working on stuff that's about 20 years out of date. Probably they could pump twice as much oil as they do now with, with an overhaul just of the equipment that they're using. It would take a few billion in a couple of years, but it could be done. And it would no longer be oil just being drilled for the, for the feeding and keeping of a, a barbaric a military and party elite who use it to finance aggression and genocide. The only country that's capable of this undertaking is the United States. The French won't do it because, or rather I hope Mr. Chalabi doesn't let them do it, because they've been bribed by Mr. Saddam Hussein up till now, as have the Russians, um, with, uh, with oil contracts in the other direction. Yes, there's going to be some hardball played about that, but it's very essential, it seems to me, that the oil resources of the region be not in the hands of someone who threatens to blow them up or to irradiate them if his rule is challenged. In other words, do you want to see what it would be like for the world economy if he was in a position uh, to threaten or to do that or to repeat what he did to the Kuwaiti oil fields last time when I remind you he set them on fire while on his way out? This is the question people have to, not, you hear people say no war over oil. Are they listening to what they're saying? What they're saying is oil isn't worth fighting about. Who really believes that? Come on. Be serious, get real. So that's, wait, wait, that's impressive. That's six people who really believe that. That's, six, that's amazing. I'm amazed there are six people in America who think oil isn't worth fighting over, but lots of luck. But wait a minute, you're saying that the oil is worth fighting over? I'm saying it's essential uh, to fight over it, yes. I'm saying it's essential that it not be the possession of of a maniacal uh, sabotaging despot, yes. All right, but are there not better alternatives to it than it, uh, than it being in well, possession want, of American oil Are companies? we going to do wind power now, um, Adam? I mean, I'm willing to talk about alternative energy if you like, but that's not the question we're being faced with now. Well, you, I... I mean, if, if, you're, if you're asking me, while we wait to see what Saddam Hussein wants, shall we talk about solar panels? I guess we could, but I think it would be a rather insipid conversation. Okay. All right. But... Okay. We're going to open things up to microphones on the floor in a second, but I want to get in another question or two first. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I want to come back to the oil thing, but look at the larger context in which Bush's war push is taking place. Uh, my fear is that the is less the repercussions of the war against Iraq, but the fact that it's happening in the framework of his doctrine of asserting the right to make a preemptive strike and impose regime change wherever it wishes, wherever it wants to. Now, you and I may favor regime change in Iraq, but Kissinger was in the business of regime change, and if Bush has established this. If, if Bush establishes the precedent of being able to do this at will in Iraq, are we not worried about where he's going to do it next? What about Brazil, for example, where uh, you know a government has taken power much disliked in Washington? It well, doesn't I, worry you? Yeah, that's a very good uh, counterposition, but I think you'll see at once that um, between uh, moving into Chile, um, overthrowing a government that has a constitution and that does have elections and murdering its elected president and moving into Iraq and sponsoring uh, political parties and elections and destroying a dictatorship, there is a difference. 
and not just a factual one or a practical one, but also a moral one. In the northern provinces of Iraq, the, the provinces that are under, currently under American protection that I mentioned before, there are, to my knowledge, 21 newspapers, uh, several political parties. A friend of mine, Dr. Baram Sali, a very fine guy, has just been elected the prime minister of, uh, of, of that part of Kurdistan. Uh, this means that we're not, we're not just bluffing or fantasizing or being utopian when we say that we have some achievements to point to. In the meanwhile, in Bahrain, um, in Gata, um, and to some extent in Kuwait, elections are being held, women are being allowed to vote in them and run in them. Uh, where, where it can be discovered, which, where the pressure for this comes from, it's the United States supporting this process, not opposing it. And as for the, the, the old cases of the banana republics in South America, I think you can see from the Inspector Clouseau-like performance of the Bush administration over the Chavez coup that never was, that the, the, the will to act in that way um, in, what, in, the, in the countries that now constitute the OAS has simply evaporated. There will not be a return to government by coup um, in South America. And if, and if there is, I just, well, what was I talking about when I said Chavez, big boy? <laughs> Colombia. And look, look at Argentina, it's had no government for nearly a year now. It barely has a pulse, it has a, hardly has a currency. Does the army want it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't, the army doesn't want it. They, they say we have to leave this to civil society, or maybe they're just cynical and say we don't want the responsibility. No, but the era of the military banana republic regime in, in Latin America is in my judgment over. There's only one military regime now in the region, which is Cuba. There's only one regime in the area that is run by men in uniform, and it's in Havana. And that, of that one, I think probably the United States wouldn't mind a regime change. In, well, but that's an old story. In, in the 1980s, Not a very creditable one, alas. In, in the 1980s, Wolfowitz and Pearl were calling for a U.S. Uh, military invasion of, of Cuba. And you don't have any fear that... No one's so calling for it now. It's not even on the axis of evil. Um, but Cuba is, Occasionally, there. people like John Bolton remember to insult uh, Fidel, the maximum leader. But the fact of the matter is, as everyone in this room knows, one way or another, the thing has run so far out of steam uh, that everyone's just waiting for it to end in its own way, and there's no need for a fight over it. That's the situation. Um, Sad in a way, because the Cuban Revolution once meant a good deal uh, to the people of Cuba and to the, and to the neighboring countries too. And it's, uh, one says this with some regret, but it has to be faced. But no, there was not going to be a return to the Golpe and the Caudillo in South America, and we would know by now if there was going to be. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you one final question about the Iraq war, and then I think it's probably time to open up the mics on the floor. Um, and my final question is this. Imagine that you are Osama bin Laden. You're sitting in your cave uh, in Afghanistan or Pakistan, or maybe in your luxury apartment in Lahore, or maybe in the basement of a mosque in Saudi Arabia. We don't know, wherever you are. You're thinking, what's going to be my best recruiting tool? Would not a US invasion of Iraq be at the top of your list? Um, I can't think where, why he thinks. I mean, I'm interested that you, you pick this, because implied in this is the idea that Mr. Bin Laden uh, takes the Iraqi side or the Saddam Hussein side in this dispute. Um, and that is indeed implied or suggested in his own broadcasts. He refers to an attack on Iraq as being an attack on the Muslim world, right? as if the Kurds were not Muslims, for example. They're Sunni Muslim, as if Ahmed Chalabi wasn't a Muslim. He's Shia Muslim, as if any replacement government in Iraq wouldn't be Muslim, as if the Northern Alliance isn't Muslim. This is, these are the ways in which Mr. Bin Laden shows to us that he's blinded by his own fatuous, limited, primitive ideology. It's this that's done us the great favor. It seems to me that if things had gone on as they were uh, before the 11th of September, the year before last, last year, excuse me, there was a, every chance that the Talibanization of Pakistan, a process that was well underway, would have been completed. Within the Pakistani secret police and army, there was a, a strong process of Talibanization to which the United States government was practically indifferent. It was about to take over the Pakistani state with its nuclear weapons. And it was drawing with complete complacency on support from Saudi Arabia, 
and elsewhere. This movement was gaining ground everywhere. Mr. Bin Laden completely ruined the plan because for him it's not enough to be a fundamentalist or a fanatic. For him there must be a grand opera, there must be the real gesture of propaganda by deed and martyrdom and sacrifice. And he has uh, made it certain, he has made it certain that um, for as long as he's willing to uh, keep on trying it, his network will be broken and broken again and he will have to hide his face. He will have to admit, as he has already had to, that he, he left behind the people of Afghanistan with his Taliban friends. They fled under cover of night, the people who they tortured and oppressed. They did not meet the infidel in battle, but they ran away. They hide now in holes and they, they can hear from us at any time they want. You wish martyrdom, we are here to help. Let me add one more thing about Mr. Bin Laden, because I'm, sh I'm really shocked how little attention it's got. If it's true, as it seems to be, that this statement is originally from him, I hope you noticed his justification for the uh, mass murder of tourists in Bali, in uh, Indonesia. Did you? He said, Australians have to be punished because of the role of Australia in assisting the independence of East Timor. Now, what the Australians did was little enough to supervise the evacuation of Indian troops from East Timor and the eventual independence of the territory, but it was Australia's responsibility under the UN. And Mr. Bin Laden now says this, is, this means we must kill Australians wherever we find them because they have separated a Christian people from Muslim Indonesia. If you want it, if you want it put any more plainly than that, what you're looking at, that you're staring right down uh, the gun barrel of fascism, um, I don't know if there's any plain away. So. Um, I'd like to lay down just a few rules for the question period. Uh, first of all, if you'd like to ask a question, I think there's two mics. You can line up at the mics and we can go back and forth. Um, we're going to let our Young Activist Award winners ask the first questions if they want to. Do you want to? Okay, so Harmony and Genevieve, could you go to you? Uh, second thing is, please actually ask a question. It's like Jeopardy. So, uh, you know, you can turn any statement into a question, but you have to do that so that Christopher or Adam can respond to it. And uh, finally, we'd like to give as many people an opportunity to speak as possible. So uh, you'll have about a minute to make your point. And when there are 15 seconds less left, I'll hit my high-tech timer. Okay. So, so again, my name is Harmony. I wanted to ask, um, I do want to put out a statement, right, and then ask a question that results from it. I think she's already made a statement. Oh, it's just a quick, it's a quick point, right, because... She's already had a lot of time at the mic. It's okay. I want to raise the question. I don't know what I think we're, are you standing? I don't know. Is that okay? It is the question, to me the question is the question of imperialism. And it's not a question of is this an abstract left analysis on the question of imperialism. The people who are in power right now have been very explicit in the newspaper, in their plans that they're trying to build an American empire. And I hear what you're saying and you have a lot of factual information to back up what you're saying, but I want to hear how you can justify any kind of U.S. In intervention when they're very explicit that what their agenda is, is to build an American empire. Okay. One at a time? Well, um, here's the situation. Um, the United States has been attacked itself uh, on its own soil by an internationally coordinated uh, movement, uh, which is also attacking in different forms innumerable other societies um, from, well, not innumerable, numerable, numerous, from Nigeria to Indonesia. Um, the way I would phrase it would be this. There's a civil war going on in the Muslim world. It's been going on for some time. Uh, the, uh, the side that uh, wants to impose the Sharia, the absolutist, theocratic form of Islam, has not much chance of winning this war, but it's a war on a very, very big front. It wants to win it 
by bringing the war to the United States and to European societies, which means we can't be neutral in the war, which is a war that goes on on rather a large front, in fact, is global. Thus, yes, there will have to be for a very long time a globalized sense of engagement and commitment to make sure that our Muslim allies, who also don't want to live under Sharia theocracy, do not lose this international civil war. Um, if some overambitious neoconservative types choose to call this an imperial responsibility on the part of the United States, I don't think that they um, very much overstate it. I wish they would find a better word um, or a more elegant term for it. But, the, but the, the, the brute facts of the situation are as I have described them, unless anyone can find a way of evading uh, this challenge or, or this responsibility. And I don't find, as I go around talking about this, that anybody can. So glib talk about imperialism gets you nowhere. Well, it gets animal noises out of some people. But if they could hear themselves doing it, they wouldn't, believe you me. Questions that you're having from the audience when, um, makes me want to ask you, where do you think the left is going now with this new kind of war? Usually, our enemies are people that are really good guys, and in this case, we have Islam fundamentalists, and I have noticed that the left is absent on so many things. For a example, when Iraq beheaded all these women and a lot of human rights groups were pretty upset about it, the left didn't say anything because it wasn't clear. So these are the kinds of things that keep me up at night. And I'm wondering, I think they keep you up at night too, where do you think the left is hitting and where would you like them to hit? And is there a left that you think is a responsible response to what's happening in the changing world? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, mean, I mean, I'm really tempted to take that as a statement, and a very good one, too. I mean, not just of your own observation that the left has failed a lot of these tests, but of the, of the realization that something ought to be done about it. But I, I hope I've given you an idea of what I would think about that by now. Have I not? I mean, if, if people really think I haven't, I'll have an, another try. But if you, if you take the case of, um, of, say, September the 11th, you have an organization that is partly a, bank, a, a, a really corrupt multinational, I'm talking about Al-Qaeda now, partly a really corrupt multinational corporation run by Saudi capital and supported by the Saudi oligarchy and, secret, and the Pakistani secret police. It's partly that. It's partly a, a crime family. It's partly a cult organization. And it's partly a, a fascist cult uh, group. This is, I think, an enemy, right? Uh, a pretty reactionary enemy, a pretty obvious. It's not just that its methods are the mass destruction of civilians, using civilian aviation to inflict further death of civilians, but its objective is a Stone Age society without music, culture, philosophy, dialectic of any kind at all. The model of being Taliban Afghanistan. It's not my objection to their means, it's to their objectives. This uh, attack puts the working class of New York in the, f in the driving seat, in the saddle. It makes a direct attack on, on democracy and on secularism and on pluralism and by the indiscriminate nature of its tactics on everything that we hold dear by way of the multicultural ethic. Hundreds of Muslims are killed in those attacks, people from every nationality as well. You couldn't really have a more clear confrontation between, let's, let's at least say, left liberalism and the right. And the left says, well, I don't know, what about East Timor? This is disgraceful. To, to try and evade, to try and sit out a moment like that, really invites historical condemnation of the kind that you can't, you can't appeal to later. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, maybe I think differently. You're tested by how you react at a moment like that, just as you are indeed when you read the reports of planned and organized genocide in northern Iraq, which we have. We have all the evidence to charge the under the Genocide Convention. And the Genocide Convention, by the way, mandates immediate action by any state as soon as the information is received, either to prevent or to punish. Now, people who are looking for neutral or evasive positions here, I think, do, do not deserve the name radical. So what you're really asking me is this, is to say what I've come to believe which is that a very large number of the American left have become a status quo force. 
And what they really wish about all this is that it hadn't come up and it hadn't happened and we didn't have to think about it because then they could go on with their domestic agenda, whatever that turns out to be. Perhaps prescription drugs for seniors. As you say, sir. As you so rightly say. I find your allegiance, please. I find your allegiance to the Kurds admirable, and a number of other points of your. Michael, could you stand back a little? I think it's. Oops. Okay. Uh, your allegiance to the Kurds is admirable, and a number of the other points you're making are very sound from, as it were, a local or a regional perspective. But you, but by talking about the evils elsewhere. Enables you to simplify the situation and kind of slide off in addressing the question directly, which I'd like you to deal with directly. There's deep concern here about the triumphalism and uh, ascendancy of the United States, not in abstract terms, but in a real historical situation in which uh, its driving forces and character are in the hands of. Uh, how can I say it delicately, worse than they have ever been in my life. Okay. I, I never thought I'd wish to have Richard Nixon back as just a simple egomaniacal thug. He looks like Mother Teresa, looks like by comparison. Okay, would you please address this question directly? What about the problems with American ascendancy in this situation? Well, um, after what you've said about uh, Dick, um, I think you'll have to admit that even if you accuse me of, of, be, of being simple, you, you are confused. Um, I can't say everything each time. Um, your question wasn't very direct. But if you want me to say what the misgivings are, uh, it's pretty easy to do. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, judge Garzon in Spain, who was the, the heroic judge in the Pinochet case, and in many other human rights cases. Uh, not long after September 11th, uh, apprehended the first Al-Qaeda cell that was fully busted um, in Europe. It was in Madrid. He had them all collared and locked down before the FBI and the CIA had even really worked out that there'd been an attack of any kind at all. And incidentally, when is anyone going to be fired at the FBI and the CIA for being asleep at the switch on this? and for eating such a gigantic share of the national security budget and leaving us defenseless under open skies. Don't ask. Anyway, Judge Garzon has got them. He got a, a, a team, six of them. But he said, I, and I'm willing to hand them over. He said, but I can't hand them over to any country that has capital punishment because European law forbids that. You can't extradite people to a nation that is, that is uh, going to execute them. Uh, this is the only country comparable to itself, that retains the barbaric practice of capital punishment. Now, John Ashcroft, as he's recently shown in the, in the Malvo case and others, prefers the exercise of capital punishment to the doing of justice, of course, but he also prefers it to law and order. The fetishizing of this filthy human sacrifice penalty means more to him than, say, cooperation with someone like Judge Garzon in the fight against terrorism. That's what tells you what you're up against. People who are ideological fanatics and not competent to defend us from enemies, either foreign or domestic. Furthermore, in their grandiosity, they insist on saying, well, all this is designed to make sure that American superiority goes on militarily now and forever and can never be challenged by any other power. Which means to say, you're saying also to people in Spain and Britain and Germany, by the way, if you want to join us and help fight what is, after all, a common threat, we want you to know your soldiers are dying for American supremacy and superiority. It's not a very brilliant way of proceeding or of, um, or of achieving uh, solidarity. And I could go on, and uh, I hope you wouldn't doubt me uh, as I've generated in print and on screen a number of other criticisms of this kind. But don't mistake me. Um, I'm, I'm uh, bringing these up because I'm committed to a, a, a pitiless and conclusive victory in this war. And I'm not, I'm not bringing up these criticisms for any other reason, and I don't trust anyone who I suspect of doing so. Yes, <clears throat> hi. 
Uh, Professor Adams kind of asked you about two main areas, which is uh, Henry, Henry Kissinger book and then uh, the war on Iraq. But there was an area of in can which you produce, like, can you there was an area question? in which you wrote extensively, and that is uh, the question of Palestine. So my question is, uh, could you please expand and comment on the situation in Palestine right now and on the Palestinian movement for uh, justice and liberation? Thank you. Well, the, um, I think I may have to ventriloquize the questioner who he asked me to, for my comments on the present state of affairs in, in Palestine. Uh, it's, he doesn't ask anything very specific. I, 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 I don't feel just like running off at the mouth about what I think about what's going well, on. Well, you should. It's a subject worth running. Yeah, but I'd like about. to be asked a proper. I'd like to be asked a question, if you know what I mean. It's like saying talk about yourself. You know, you suddenly think. All right, uh, well, I know the subject, but I wonder what the hell. I have, I have a question more specific. The question would be. Is, good. is the two-state solution still viable in your? Ah, that's much concept. better. That's a lot better. Thank you. Well. It's, no, it's, that's much better because it dramatizes something very important. It's quite clear that the present government in Israel hopes to uh, avoid it uh, or forestall a two-state solution by completing the annexation of the occupied territories as quickly as it can and pronouncing that a fait accompli by making it undoable. Some people, Meron Benvenisti for one, Eil Weizmann for another, have produced impressive documentation suggesting that the annexation of the territories is already nearly complete. And this, of course, very much reduces the pressure uh, on Palestinians uh, to uh, consider a two-state solution as their program either. And uh, the, uh, one of the appalling consequences or causes of that, because I believe it to be both cause and consequence, is the decision by some Palestinian organizations to conduct attacks within Israel itself upon kibbutzim or old people's homes or civilian targets within the borders of pre-1967 Israel um, and suicide attacks, um, murder attacks in Jerusalem and elsewhere which quite clearly expressed the intention uh, to remove all Jews from Palestine. Now that, that is of course precisely the propaganda with which Ariel Sharon uh, would like to deal uh, because it justifies his own rejectionism and in my opinion the Palestinian parliament, for example, would already have voted Mr. Arafat out, as it nearly did, if Mr. Uh, Sharon hadn't confined Mr. Arafat in Ramallah. So there's an, another negative dialectic here, if you like, another negative ecumenicism, where the thuggish elements on both sides feed upon one another. Well, here, clearly, a very, a very special responsibility descends upon the United States, which has the power uh, to arrest um, these settlements and the power to uh, enforce a solution and uh, instead pretends to be both uh, uh, a mediator um, while in fact it's a participant and that seems to me something that American voters and uh, citizens should have long ago have forced them to decide about. Is the United States a mediator in the Palestine dispute or is it the patron and armorer and financier of one side in it? We can't go on like this much longer. Yes, my name is Joseph Anderson, and I say that to say that uh, if anyone's interested, they can plug my name into a search box in the Berkeley Daily Planet or the San Francisco Chronicle and read a letter that I wrote about the former SFM on uh, 12, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 12 16 December 16, 2000, and in the San Francisco Chronicle on December 18, 2000. Um, I would like to say that uh, I've had an amiable acquaintanceship with uh, Christopher Hitchens. I've agreed with him on some issues, disagreed with him on other issues, and uh, I dare say corrected him on still others. I must say that I'm shocked that, in a, that a Mario Savio Award recipient was not allowed her free speech to make a comment tonight, but restricted only to a question. I would welcome a real debate such as this in almost any other venue. But I believe that a debate, a pseudo-debate, hardly even a debate like this, where we have a, we have a, a lecturer who's pro-war in Yugoslavia, pro-war in Afghanistan, me. Me. and pro-war in Iraq, is an insult 
to the memory of Mario Sabio. And I hate to say this, but I believe that Lynn Hollander Sabio has become the Coretta Scott King to the memory of Mario Sabio. Okay, excuse me. This is an insult. Why don't you guys, why don't you guys clap that be, too? Why don't you clap that too? This should not be clap. allowed Go on, clap. to happen. Monkey. Excuse me, could we have the next question, please? The, the Guardian news... Contemptible Sorry. remark. Shameful, contemptible remark by a guy who always comes to my readings, always takes up everybody's time, always awards himself airtime, and never buys one of my damn books. <laughs> Probably because he can't read. You talk more than almost anyone uh, okay. No, leave him there. Leave him, leave him there. It's fine. The, the leave him there. Could you go on with the next yeah. question, please? The Guardian newspaper. You knew what you looked like, mister. Uh, it comments on um, when you compare what they uh, said about September 11th, you compare it to what they wrote about uh, the sarin gas attack in Tokyo or the bombing of the Oklahoma Federal Building. In your opinion, what about September 11th was so attractive to the Guardian newspaper? I didn't get the last sentence, I'm sorry. Like, in your opinion, what about the September 11th attack was so attractive to the editorial staff of the Guardian newspaper? Manchester Guardian, so it's your, it's your countryman. What about the September 11th attack was so attractive to the editorial staff of the Manchester Guardian? That's an extraordinary question. I mean, I... Um, I don't really think it's a proper question for me. I have no insight into their editorial processes. If you mean why did September the 11th get more coverage than, say, the sarin gas in the Tokyo subway, which I believe you mentioned. Why did they not condemn the September 11th Why did they, why did the Guardian not condemn the September 11th attacks, someone asked? Well, I'm sorry, I, uh, we are, we have a planetary difference here. <laughs> You managed to do this whole presentation quite, a, I agree with you 100% on the crimes of religion. Uh, we have no disagreement on that. But you did not once in your presentation mention the fact that the United States, who, who, which, is, which you are defending, is responsible through its military and economic arms for the deaths of tens of millions of people in the world every year compared to what the Muslim fundamentalists, by the way, who were largely created as a political force by the United States, and are still in many places used by the United States as a, as a, as a political force against the left where necessary. Compared to them, though, well, uh, uh, I mean, compared to the United States' oppression and murder around the world, these fundamentalists are, are small-time players. And if anybody but these fundamentalists uh, killed 3,000 Americans in retaliation for what the U.S. did, I think a reasonable person could say it was a drop in the bucket for what the U.S. really has coming as a nation. Thank you. Well, thank you, too. Did you want to comment? No. Of course not. Maybe so. Hi. My name is Abe Gardner. I'm with the Berkeley ACLU. I'm an executive with Common Cause of California at Berkeley, and I'm with Democracy Matters on campus. I'd like to ask you a question regarding oil. Um, I feel as though the response that um, you gave to the question earlier was indeed interesting and has an interesting point, but I'd like to know more about if this, if Saddam Hussein were to gain weapons of mass destruction, and if he did, had the ability to control up to 44% of the oil reserves of the world in that region as a result due to change or shift in the balance of power, I don't understand how you can justify a claim that this is not a war about oil, particularly given the political interests of the Bush family. But my dear sir, did I not plainly say that anyone who didn't think war, oil was worth fighting about was a fool? That if, clearly it's a, a, a war about oil. You said before that oil is worth fighting over, must be fought over, if it's not to become the property of megalomaniac. A pyromaniac a despots. Yes, I certainly, most certainly did. I, I mean, in terms of the power of the United States in the oil industry, rather than in terms the of. money going to a specific person who you clearly disagree with. Thank you. 
I mean, people used to say there were braver slogans in the old days, like, no blood for Texaco, for example. Or, and I remember it myself, um, the, the obvious fact that the United States government had overthrown uh, an elected regime in, in Iran, the Mossadegh regime in the 1950s, in order to uh, get a preponderance of American oil companies over British ones in the Anglo Iranian Oil Corporation. This was all great stuff. You know, we could do real populism then about empire, oil, and attacks on democracy. The sad thing is that none of it applies now, as you can see from the whimperingly no good slogans that you get, like no war over oil, which means nothing unless you think oil is unimportant. Now, it bears on an important question that hasn't come up, which I might just take a minute on. Many people say, look, Saddam Hussein may be horrible. Everyone likes to clear their throat this way and say they don't really like him. Um, everyone except Ramsey Clark and a, a few fans of the Ba'ath Party want to get this out of the way. Of course, we agree he's a bad guy. But, you know, he understands self-preservation. He understands deterrence. He can be boxed in and so forth. Now, having invaded Kuwait, which was an insane thing for him to have done, and having refused pressure from almost every member of the Arab League, the whole of the United Nations, and every other conceivable neighbor or international group to withdraw his forces, uh, Saddam Hussein was told by a note delivered personally by James Baker that he was going to be pushed out by a coalition that involved the Egyptian army, the Syrian army, the French army, everyone you can think of. Uh, but that, uh, and there was no chance that he could resist being pushed out, but he was to not do two things. He was not to try and use nerve or chemical gas agents on American or coalition forces on pain of what were called the most extreme and severe consequences. And he was not to set fire to the Kuwaiti oil fields before he abandoned them. Now, we don't know, at least I will claim I don't know, whether the Gulf War syndrome and some other illnesses do result from some rash commander, perhaps with orders, trying out nerve gas in that war or not. The jury's out on that. There's a strong suspicion that he did, but there's no doubt at all that on his way out of Kuwait, he blew up the Kuwaiti oil fields, set them up, set them ablaze, flooded the Gulf, killed, new, normal, for those of you who care about these kinds of things, and I know you do, killed huge numbers of seals, birds, that kind of thing. <laughs> While I'm in Berkeley, I'm not gonna waste this opportunity. Um, generally behave very bad, but, but also insanely, megamaniacally, pyromaniacally, um, and without, without rationality. Now the question is, do you want to find out what this guy would be like if he ever got the uranium or the plutonium? Do you want to find that out or not? Or would you rather say that we've seen enough and we would rather take the side of his enemies and of his people and see the last of him? I think that's a no-brainer myself. There's another guy, another guy advertising his wares from the back of the hall. A cheap peddler crying his uh, wares. From the... um, in, we, in... We're not going to... No takers, I understand. So we're, we're not going to get everybody to a, you know, come to a consensus, so that's fine. Let's go. <laughs> uh, in 1989, Benjamin Netanyahu told a group of... Uh... Yeah. I'm too tall, the microphone's too short. Um, in, in 19... It's fine. In 1989, Benjamin Netanyahu told a group of Israeli college students that Israel should have took advantage of Tiananmen Square massacres to expel Palestinians from the West Bank and Gaza. In recent polls this summer, over 60% of Israelis supported transferring Palestinians from the occupied territories. With the rightward shift of Israel, with the elections coming up, with the fact that it, uh, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is a leading Likud candidate, um, what do you think about the prospects of Israel using the war in Iraq as a cover for ethnic cleansing as a lot of Palestinians and Israelis right now are, are afraid of? And has that figured into your you know, calculations and your position on uh, the war in Iraq? Thank you. Um, the, the Sharon government has invited, the situation is in some ways worse than you say, in some ways perhaps not as bad. The Sharon government has invited on more than one occasion its shifting coalitions. Uh, the supporters or leaders of uh, pro-expulsion parties into, into the Israeli cabinet. It's uh, well known. Uh, people who openly advocate what is disgustingly called transfer. In other words, the, the, the deportation, forcible deportation of the remaining Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza, in, either into Jordan across the river or into Gaza into a kind of massive holding pen uh, pending a, a further solution. Um, 
And there are, uh, it's very sad to have to say, uh, quite a number of uh, people in the United States, including quite senior Republican congressmen and spokesmen for the Christian Coalition and others who have also advocated this. Um, and it seems to me a great, a great responsibility on everybody's part to repudiate this idea of a, of a racist cleansing campaign. Uh, whether it was conducted under cover of war or for any other reason. Now the question is, would war make it more likely or less? I personally think it makes it less, but I hope I'm, I hope I'm not being optimistic because the, um, the United States government in, the, in such a case, it seems to me, would have no choice at all but to forcibly restrain Israel or any, or any crazy general or politician who liked the idea from taking advantage of uh, a war which involves the international interest, the will of the UN, and a whole number of other very important civilizational questions. For Israel to take advantage of such a thing, to pursue a policy that is evidently racist and repulsive, would be unpardonable and I think would be opposed. I think would be opposed. But it's something I think there should be a lot more vigilance about than there is, and I think it's very badly reported in our press that there is this constant threat for, um, for, a, for a cleansing of the, of the occupied territories. I, I think we maybe should take one more question from each, each side, and then uh, Christopher will be out at the table uh, signing books, and you can talk to him individually at that time. If you're holding a receipt. Yeah. <laughs> the pro bono period will be over by then. Okay, let's go over here. Uh, you said that, you know, no blood for oil is simplistic. And, uh, you know, and of course, oil is worth fighting for. I, I just wonder how far do you go with that? I mean, is it worth burying people alive in the desert for oil? I mean, if you ask me, you ask me, I mean, you seriously ask me specifically, is it worth not just fighting for oil, a war, but fighting a war in which people were killed? Were buried alive. I mean, shall we say, or burned alive. Why not burned alive? Why not blown to pieces? Why not? Um, How many I, I Iraqis think, are I mean, going to die I don't think, I don't think it's a very, change. I don't think it's a very deconstructive uh, um, rephrasing of my original point. I mean, yes, if it's worth fighting for, I'm willing to accept that what I'm willing to accept what's entailed in what I say. Can you take one more question, sir? Just one more question. Am I going Just to enlist? Question. That's a good one. Can you take one more question, sir? Just one um, more I, question. I hope, it, I hope it has struck people by now that we're talking about a war or series of conflicts in which, um, in which civilians uh, uh, American civilians are uh, quite near the front line, in fact, nearer than many soldiers are. So it seems to me ridiculous to, um, uh, to ask of people whether they favor the war or oppose it, what their attitude to enlistment is. You've already been enlisted, sweetie, uh, by being a civilian. Sir, can uh, I ask you one more I, question? Could I have a question here, actually? I'll, I'll give you a chance to. But sure. I've, well, well. Yeah. Okay. I've noticed, I've read, I've, Christopher, I've read a lot of what you've written in the past year, and you never talk about the uh, people who may be killed in this war, uh, not the Iraqis or the Americans. And I think you are con when you talk about the Americans who are on the front lines, you are conflating the Iraqi war and uh, the bin Laden forces uh, which are not one and the same, in fact. And I would just like you to address the question of uh, the numbers of people that may be killed in this war and is the consequence, and at what point do, is that consequence outweighed by, um, you know, the oil? Is it, how many people are worth uh, killing in order to protect the oil? Well. <clears throat> It's very flattering of, me, of you to ask me as if I knew the answer to what, to whether more people, it's very flattering, <clears throat> excuse me, it's distinctly flattering to be asked so respectfully and politely I must say, as if I might know whether more people would die whether Saddam Hussein forced us into war now or later. I mean, in other words, that I could guarantee, I could tell you in advance what the respective tolls might be uh, or how many people he might kill if there was no war with him at all. I can't tell you the answer to that either. I would suspect on the past 
uh, evidence a lot, would be the answer. On your point of conflation, um, I'm not so sure you're right to say that the, the civilian soldier dichotomy um, is as strong as you think. I don't know who put anthrax in my mailroom in Washington uh, last year. Uh, nobody does yet. I know there are people who think it would be witty to make it smallpox uh, instead. And I know that the Iraq has been involved in uh, producing and distributing a great deal of this stuff. And I certainly know those are the weapons of choice of the other side. So no, I don't feel that there's any uh, question at all. One reason why people are taking this argument so seriously is because in the age of weapons of mass destruction, wielded by the way by either side, the distinction between civilian and soldier is more or less morally abolished at least as, re as regards safety or the right to criticize. After all, if I was a woman taking this position, um, and suppose I was 55 and a mother, you wouldn't taunt me for not putting on a uniform and say I had no right to my opinion, would you? So if you don't want to be addressed as a moron, don't talk to people as if they were stupid. Well, sometimes the temptation is a bit much, I have to say. Yeah, um, well, at the 150 year of history of intervention around the world, uh, again, what have we got here? Like Allende, in Panama, in uh, Yugoslavia, overthrowing government, what do you think guarantees that the United States is going to be fair and impose justice wherever it goes with this? Uh, uh, with these armies, and uh, why do you think the United States has the right to intervene all around the world and impose its bases all around the planet and its corporations around the planet and this, this uh, very honorable uh, intent of uh, bringing democracy around the world? Uh, I, I mean, where do you find those morals uh, in, in this regime? And then uh, the other thing is, uh, oh. if you are so concerned about the life of the Kurds, uh, are you concerned about the people that were killing Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all of the other war that the United States carry around the planet? Uh, I, I mean, are you concerned about that? Are you concerned about the weapon mass destruction that the arsenal that the United States has? Uh, I, I, I could think, you could uh, you finish up, please? Uh, these are questions. These are all questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the last question, the last question is, uh, I, I used to reminiscing of the old decadent British Empire. <coughs> I never thought, I never thought I'd be doing this, but I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the last bit. <laughs> How perfectly ghastly. Uh, well, maybe someone can tell me what the British bit was. Am I reminiscent of it? Well, that would be for someone else to say. Um, am I nostalgic for it? I could say. But the, I think, uh, as with the rest of the question, I'm going to make an arrogant assumption. I'm going to say that I don't believe anyone will object if I say I've had enough of it. And uh, I have answered all those questions already. And um, it's time for me uh, to go and sign books. But thank you very much. Can indeed. you take one more? Can you just one more, sir? I came a long way. Mr. Hitchens, can you take one more?